ignoring that cat. That's what training does. And again, kudos to you guys. I mean, if you kind of didn't, you know, kind of let her kind of experience things on her own four paws, if you guys didn't continue to work with her, stuff like that. Most dog owners, most novice dog owners would see situations like that and say, my dog does not like this, so we are not going to do this. And kudos to you guys. You guys worked right through it, which is what she needed. And, you know, the problem with that is, is that, you know, my ego aside, the problem is that I know that these dogs, if they don't face those types of things, again, the facility and training and stuff like that brings out who they really are inside. Yeah. So it's cool to see that kind of improvement. Okay. We have this client that we've been working with for years now. Uh, his name's Mark, great guy. Uh, he um, travels back and forth between Canada, Montreal specifically, and Cleveland all the time. Uh, I think partially for work. Uh, his fiance lives up in Canada and stuff. Uh, and he's very connected in the pot cake world. So pot cakes are basically uh, this like breed of dogs, like an island breed of dog. And uh, they notoriously have a lot of behavioral issues. We worked with a lot of them at this point that he sent our way. And he's got one, you can, you can go past. <clears throat> um, he's got somebody that he got connected with. He's very into like the groups and stuff like the pot cake groups. And we've kind of became known in these groups that he's a part of as like the pot cake trainers. Uh, and uh, he's got this lady from like, I think he said like Finland or something like that or some somewhere internationally that I don't remember exactly where he said um, that needs to train this dog or else the dog is going to basically, get, I think, like uh, rehomed or put down or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's a bad situation. And he's trying to connect us <laughs> and he's trying to get this dog in from wherever it's coming from up for a board and train so we could train the dog we're figuring out specifics as far as like how we could accommodate um getting the dog in and taking the dog as well as then sending the dog home uh and getting them the proper information they would need to be successful so that'd be pretty sweet if we can get that set up um we'll see what happens and figure things out they can't have anybody come over to the house or any that kind of stuff okay she's trying to figure out a way to bring the dog here possibly okay or bring it to Montreal and then I bring it part way and yeah anyway I don't know like what's your one don't know what your your costs are anymore don't know what sure. your uh, um, timing is like as yeah. far as availability for yeah well I would which I think it's summer kind of thing sure yeah I you know I would say obviously given the circumstances of like travel and all that kind of stuff uh, I would say I could be pretty accommodating of whatever would work for them um, you know, I, I typically try to leave at least enough flexibility in my schedule for situations, you know, like this or like something that's a little bit more uh, dire of getting started sooner rather than later. So I would say as far as timing is concerned, we could do it whenever would be convenient for them, obviously. Um, you know, cost wise, um, currently our board and train program is thirty five hundred dollars, uh, you know, obviously because they're going to inquire some expenses and like travel and stuff like that. I probably can work with them a little bit on that as well. Um, okay. Yeah, because she's actually going to have to do a GoFundMe thing. And yeah, sure. You drink it's kind of like what we did with Cameron. Where, yeah, yeah. Um, I I would be. She uh, can raise some money and we can pay the difference. Sure. But, yeah, um, I I would be happy to uh, you know do my part and uh, and offer you guys a little bit of a discount on that as well. I, I could crunch some numbers and stuff of exactly what that would look like, um, but okay. uh, I'd I'd be happy to to try to help out where I can with that too. 
Um, yeah, I mean, as far as like how something like that would work, I think really it would come down to what they would be able to do travel-wise on if they would be able to at least come up here for like a send home or absolute worst case scenario. Like I have done situations in the past with out-of-town clients where we train the dog, somebody else picks up the dog, and then we do like virtual classes to like get them up to speed with everything. And it's much less ideal doing it that way, but it's still doable, you know? Um, cause yep. we would at least know the dog well enough to be able to, you know, give proper feedback and information on, on how to kind of go through some of this stuff. Um, so, so I would say the first step here would be figuring out how realistic getting the dog up here would be, you know, uh, and what kind of time frame you guys would be looking at as far as that's concerned from there, we could yep. discuss specifics as far as, like I said, like how we would go about getting them that follow-up support so that we can make it as successful as possible. So. Sure. Okay. Great. All right, yeah, because, um, I mean, it's a 40-hour drive yeah. <laughs> from where she lives to Cleveland. And yeah. So, they say she would, it's like 28 hours to Montreal, and if sure. the dog is not too insane, <clears throat> you know, I can yeah. take, you mm -hmm. know, bring him the rest of the way. We don't want to, she talked about putting the dog at a, you know, on a plane, and that be, I, that would be messed up because if this dog's already fearful, yeah, alone on a plane and doing connections and yeah. oh man, that dog, you'd get, it'd take you two weeks to unwind the dog. Yeah, I mean, you know, not saying that I recommend, you know, obviously if we could get the dog driven, that would be more ideal. But like, I'll tell you, like, I I've seen plenty of people like ship dogs in situations before, and it's it, it's it's not quite as big of a recovery process as you would think for the dog. Um, so, you know, that's not completely out of the cards as far as if that really is what it would take to do so. Um, but you know, uh, yeah, obviously we would prefer just getting the dog driven. Right. So. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I, I'd, I'd be happy to help wherever I can, you know, as far as cost and stuff is concerned, like I said, we, we'll figure something out that works for everybody. Uh, I'm not worried about that. Uh, and time frame wise, like I said, it's just going to depend on what's going to work for them as far as that is concerned as well. All right. If she were to want to call you and talk to you about this, you yep. okay with it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Give her give her my number. number. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. I really appreciate the call back. Yeah, no problem. All right. We'll be in touch. Uh, all right. Thanks. Take care. All right. So there's this social going on down there with Callie. Callie did some training somewhere else, I believe, and was labeled as highly dog aggressive. I'll tell you. You getting this? She ain't that dog aggressive. It's gonna be great. That scene at the end where like all of them were in it. Gold Bloom, Alan Grant, Laura Dern, Chris Pratt, Bryce, and they're all there and they're like, don't move. And then Jeff Goldblum's in the back and he's like, why do they always make them bigger? Why do they always make them bigger? And this big ass dinosaur about to fucking eat the shit out of them. Really no. All right. Good boy. It's a Harry. Good boy. Good boy. Harry, crank. Last one, last one. Made it. <clears throat> you know, it's really interesting, like, as they continue to figure each other out, right? So, like, because the play at nature is just the competition between them, realistically, at some point, they should hit a point where they're not as interested in playing as intensely with each other as they actually actually figure it out. Like I saw that with all of my dogs. So Vera and Deli used to play nonstop all the time in a really intense manner like that. Then they got in that one fight when I was out of town one time. And after that, when we put them back together, they figured it out and they were done. I don't think they ever played past just like a couple seconds here and there again after that. They're just cool. They hang out with each other, they lay on the couch together, they go lay by the fucking heater vents together and stuff, and they're just, they're good now, you know? Uh, Waffles and Vera are at this stage right now, and Waffles and Vinny, where they play hard as fuck all the time. And same deal, I suspect that at a point, once one of them 
figures it out, right? And whether that's they figure it out organically on their own or it progresses and escalates into something and I need to step in and intervene for it, same deal. That'll kind of diminish on its own a little bit. And it's kind of good when we'll see a situation like that where it's like they start squabbling a little bit and it's not a big deal, obviously, and we need to step in and give a correction for it. And then they're like, oh, okay. Ultimately, even though we're figuring this out, there still is somebody there, that is the central authority figure, that when it hits a point where I do start getting uncomfortable with it, I resort to looking to them for that judgment and for that guidance. Come. Good. Okay. Lucy, come. Good. Okay. Lucy, come. Good. Okay. Lucy, come. Good.
right, guys, we're moving through all the things we have to do today. We're moving a little bit slow. Today was a podcast day that typically takes a lot of energy out of me, uh, and I haven't had very much coffee today, so bear with us as we, you know, take our time, go with the flow with things. So I got a question on Instagram from Abby. Abby asked, I have another question that I don't think I've ever heard you discuss. Tahoe has been having chronic ear issues and needing meds almost daily. Well, he's learned that he can just squirm around to make the process more difficult. Is it fair to give corrections for his squirmy behavior while I'm trying to give the medication? I also don't really have a command for be still. If I put him in a down, he will just roll over onto that ear so I can't give him the medicine. Uh, good question, and I would say tricky, oh, Michelle's gonna get pissed at me, I'm sorry. I'm using your thing as a microphone stand. All right, so to answer your question, it's not that it's not fair to give a correction for the squirminess, I just don't necessarily think it would be a very clear one to give, because you have to ask yourself if you're giving a correction for something, what is the expectation post-correction? And to say to not squirm, that's extremely gray. Like what defines squirming? Is squirming just moving a little bit? Is squirming moving a lot of bit? Is it when they start rolling around? Is it this, is it that? It's very difficult to create a clear expectation for the dog where they're gonna be able to understand and stop doing whatever it is that you want. So my recommendation would be to use something like a down. Then you get into the secondary part of, you said he'll kind of roll onto his side when you're trying to give those ear medications at that point. And same deal, in the way that we typically teach downs, we don't necessarily have an expectation that they need to be perfectly upright. So you can't necessarily correct for that either. So that's where I would get into the down and then I would utilize a lot of positive reinforcement in order to help shape the expectation and start to little by little get them more comfortable with it. Certain things like pouring ear medication in and stuff like that can be extremely intrusive on dogs. They cannot like it a lot. So it's understandable that he's going to be pretty squirmy while it's happening. So we want to start to then counter condition the behavior. I don't use that term a lot, but this is a case that would be appropriate because he's not necessarily doing anything incorrect. He's just agitated by it, right? So once you have him comfortably holding that down, I would start practicing putting things in the ear. So if he rolls on one side, stick the thing in the one ear. As soon as you get it done, mark with good, give a reward, repeat process, repeat process, repeat process, until he starts to not necessarily love having the thing in his ear, but become much less averse by it. Um, <clears throat> You know, another thing that you could do is you could teach the dog to essentially tolerate the handling better through like a counter conditioning process. So if he's rolling around and squirming, we could make the expectation holding him still as opposed to like being still and not resisting. Right, So no different than we would do with nails if we were to grab a paw and if the dog starts resisting, teach them. Pressure applies when you resist. Pressure releases when you don't resist. I could grab it and hold like the head or something, right? And if he starts resisting or loop under a collar or something, whatever's going to be easiest for you to get the medication in, obviously. Hold still, wait for the resistance, you know? When the resistance starts, kind of hold him still still, and then the second he loosens up, you loosen up, and then you reward for the loosening up, and you can kind of teach a little bit of like a forced hold like that, and then counter condition that process as well. Um, there are certain things like this that, you know, some dogs are just gonna like or they're not gonna like. Like Vinny, he lets me do his nails, but he doesn't love letting me do his nails. Same with ear medication. Deli, our, uh, our pity is very touch sensitive about things, and same deal, if you're digging around in her ears and stuff like that. She does not necessarily love that either, but we've taught that it's just something you have to tolerate, and I've just figured out whatever sort of position I need to put the dog in physically without a command, uh, and just physically taught the dog to not resist that restraint. So that's where I would start with it. Hope it helps. Cutie. When I first started training dogs, anytime I would take one of my dogs to like a family function or something like that, Everybody would always like call up to me and be like, show me what she knows. Do oh some tricks. Can you really paw? Like, I don't really want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like, it's, like, uh, it's, like, it's like if you were like a skateboard, you were like, do a kickflip. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Or if you played guitar and you're like, play like, Stairway to Heaven. Mm -hmm. Or something like that. You know, it's like, that's the equivalent of this. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Such a douchey thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, come! Whoa! Oh, sit! Oh! Down! Life of the party right now. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs>
Nah, 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 no, yeah.